very much at home, even though I just arrived. I feel at home because uh, uh, the Social Security Administration has, ever since it was established, been uh, a sort of a special concern of mine. Although by uh, the tricanary of politics, uh, it was not placed in the Department of Labor, where I, of course, thought it should be, uh, <laughs> I never could quite get over my attachment uh, to the Social Security Administration. And I have watched it and have been associated with it uh, with great interest ever since, ever since it was established. Uh, as a matter of fact, of course, uh, uh, the re one of the reasons I feel so uh, deeply involved in the Social Security Administration is that even though it was not in the Department of Labor, when it was first established, the Department of Labor had to carry it the way you carry a dependent child. Uh, you didn't have any money. <laughs> And uh, that was so unfortunate. And we didn't have very much either. Uh, but uh, uh, what we did was to uh, provide the Social Security Administration with uh, offices in the Department of Labor building. And I even uh, gave to the Social Security, uh, the chairman of the Social Security Board, uh, uh, as it was in those days, the chairman, the man who was administering the thing, I gave him the large, handsome, Red post and high back chair out of my own office so that he could look like a king. You know, and uh, I didn't have to keep on looking like a queen. Uh, I found the chair very uncomfortable. And <laughs> so I made the sacrifice. You know. <laughs> well, the whole department did the same thing. And we gave them our best statisticians, we gave them our, uh, our best everything, uh, and including. Uh, uh, by this time, I had given them uh, Arthur Altmaier, who had been the Assistant Secretary of, St uh, of Labor, and my real right hand, without whom I felt very lost, I had given them already Arthur Altmaier as a member of the board. And so that we put our best people into there on loan, and we did carry it for the first year, uh, and made it look like a going concern. In fact, it became a going concern in an extraordinarily a uh, short time, and about that I will try to tell you. When I was asked uh, uh, to speak today about, uh, 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 Mr. Fry said over the telephone, uh, oh, we'll just talk about uh, the roots, that sounds good, the roots or the beginnings of the Social Security Act. Well, I said the roots is better, you know, because it doesn't seem to mean anything, and uh, uh, if I get an inspiration, perhaps I can think up a root. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I, uh, but I do, I do well, I have thought of a root, and uh, what, I would, what I want to say is this, that I suppose the roots, if you look at the beginnings of the idea uh, that we ought to have something of this sort, uh, that we ought to uh, make a systematic, set up a systematic method of taking care of the material needs of the aged, the aged and dependent, the aged and sick, the aged and poor, and later the aged. Uh, who must, something must be wrong with them, or they wouldn't be aged, you know. Uh, uh, I suppose the roots of it really spring from that deep well of charitableness which resides in the American people, and the efforts and the struggles of charity, uh, and charity workers, and social workers, uh, to handle the problems of people who were growing old and had no means of support or not adequate means of support, not able to afford to do this or that. The efforts of the charitable workers, of the church workers, of the social workers, uh, these, out of this impulse uh, to be kind to the poor, uh, sprang, I suppose, the, the, the mulling of ideas about uh, social insurance for the aged. But, uh, those people who were doing it didn't even know that it was social insurance. They just kept thinking that something definite, something that people could look forward to, uh, would be a great asset and a great assistance to them in their work. Even de Tocqueville, you know, in his memoirs of his visit to America, mentions what he thought was a very unique uh, uh, state of mind of the American people, that they were so honestly concerned about their poor and that they did so much personally for them. It was not a social, a social action. It was not a, uh, 
it, it, was, it was a personal action. It was not an organization. It was not a national action. It was not a state action. It was not government. It was a personal action. And he mentions this as being characteristic of the American people. They were so generous and so kind and so charitably disposed. Well, I don't know anything about the times in which de Tocqueville uh, visited America. They were a long time ago, and I know very little about the psychological state of mind of the people of this country at that time. But I do know that by the time I came into the field of social work, this was true. It was surprising what we were able to do uh, by volunteer work, uh, by, by, by volunteer support of organizations who help the poor and particularly the aged. Just look all over the country at the uh, old ladies' homes and the old couples' homes and the old members' homes uh, that sprang up. And there are, uh, because of the fact that aged people uh, had necessities that had to be met, and somebody got together and got money together and established an old woman's home or an old man's home or an old couple's home. And, and uh, life went on for them after a fashion as recipients, of course, of a kind of charity. Uh, these things have been going on for years. What was the name of that book? It escaped, escaped me now. It was written about four or five years ago. It was really a history of social work. Great thick book. Oh, you must know it. Somebody here. <laughs> must have a better memory than I've got. <laughs> I reviewed the book, too, so I know it well. <laughs> But it, it was really, it was a book that when I, I wrote in my review that this is the book I always hoped I would write. Uh, it really is very good indeed, and I wish I could give you its name, but look, ask your librarian here, she'll know. And uh, it was, it, this book went way back, you know, to the beginnings of organized charity in the United States, and one realized how many people had been working at these same problems, as they were called, for many years without the benefit of knowing anything about them social insurance or having any ideas on that subject. Uh, but actually, of course, uh, the, the beginnings of total interest in uh, social security uh, and as, a, as a, an insurance program, program as through the use of an insurance technique, uh, began uh, in a serious way uh, shortly before uh, the Great Depression of 29. Uh, when I say shortly, I mean a couple of years. It had begun to be an academic subject. It was discussed by highbrows, not by politicians. It was, uh, well, it was uh, a possible thing, you know. Uh, we, we knew something about social insurance in this country, just a very little, but that was by virtue of the Workmen's Compensation Act, uh, which is, of course, a form of social insurance. And that was all we knew about insuring uh, a known hazard uh, by payment into a, by payment of persons related to that hazard into a fund from which those few who might be affected uh, by the hazard against which the insurance was written could be compensated if they uh, had the particular accident that was described in the law. And of course, workmen's compensation was was uh, very much opposed when it was when the agitation for it began in 1908. That was already late in the day. They had it in Germany and England and the Danish and Scandinavian countries for a long time. Uh, and, and, and Americans going to uh, Europe had often observed, particularly the German system, which in the usual German way was much more thorough and logical than the English or Scandinavian systems, although they all worked very well. Uh, so we knew a little bit about social, about social insurance and even the word social insurance had come to be at least an academic word. People uh, who studied the matter, students and highbrows generally, uh, could understand what it meant, and they, but they never seemed to have thought of insuring other social hazards. Uh, social, social hazards, social problems were taken care of by the states, and social problems uh, for which appropriated money and provided homes or institutions for the victims of the toughest types of, 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 of hazards uh, and uh, by voluntary organizations and societies which did all they could to relieve the sufferings caused by the particular hazard, uh, but by no means could touch all of it. Uh, and so we went along amiably, uh, you 
know, always in our general American optimistic way, believing that everything would turn out all right. Uh, we, two or three studies were started of social insurance one time or another. They, were nearly, they nearly always made a report of some sort, but before the report got written and filed, the crisis was over. And so we forgot about it. That never happened again, we said. And um, this was really true in 1919, just after the First World War. Uh, New York City had a terrific problem of unemployment. It was really very hazardous. It, was, uh, it involved so many people. It was short, sharp, uh, painful. Uh, the unemployed uh, marched in the streets. The unemployed uh, uh, were allowed to sleep in the churches, I remember. And uh, the unemployed, uh, uh, Henry Brewer and uh, Paul Kennedy, who was then the head of the New York Association for Labor Legislation, opened a, uh, a place down on the Bowery called the Hotel de Pink, which was a clean, cheap, uh, and honest uh, lodging house uh, where a man could get free lodging if necessary and could do just about as he pleased. If he was a low-down fellow, nobody ever noticed him. Unless he stole, he couldn't steal anything else he could do. And uh, that wasn't true, of course, of the municipal lodging house. If he was bad behaved, badly behaved, he just got turned out. Uh, whereas at the Hotel de King, who could do any, could sing vulgar songs and uh, make vulgar jokes and make a noise and all that kind of thing. And it was a great relief, a great relief to the unemployed, unmarried, unsettled, unfamily man who was the um, unemployed person that one saw marching in the streets. One didn't see the women, the children, the families dependent on other people. Uh, they were, although uh, known to be part of the problem, uh, they did not show. But after all, when we came to the problem of doing something for the poorer kind of people, as John Garner, that, uh, remember, uh, what was it somebody called him? Uh, that um, red-faced, uh, whiskey-drinking old man? John L. Lewis called him that, I remember. Uh, well, he, you know, he proved he was an extraordinary person. He was certainly no flaming radical. Uh, but uh, when some of these problems were discussed in cabinet meeting, it's John L. Garner that I, I remember. Uh, uh, a little deep he was. And he would lean forward to listen with his ear cupped like this. And I remember his getting awfully out of patience at the long-winded... Uh, elaborate statements that people made about the unemployed situation, the unemployment that existed in 30, in 33 and 34. And finally he would burst out and he said, Mr. President, Mr. President, I think we promised to do something for the poorer kind of people. We better be about it. We better be about it. Uh, not talk so much. We better be about it. This, of course, was absolutely true. He understood the poorer kind of people to be the people who needed, needed something. He didn't know what. He knew nothing about social insurance. But the, pe the poorer kind of people uh, were the people that had to be helped. When we came to consider uh, the problems of the poorer kind of people in uh, 33, after the Roosevelt administration took office, uh, we, of course, had had a lot of experience with poverty in a very recent form. Uh, we had had the experience since 29 of the short, sudden drop of everything. The total economy went to pieces just shook to pieces under us, beginning, of course, with a, with, a, with a stock market crisis, crash, a banking crisis following it, manufacturing crisis following it, uh, merchandising crisis following it. Everybody felt it by, <coughs> in, in less than a year, it, it was a terror. Uh, people were alarmed, so that all through to the rest of 29 and 30, 31, uh, the specter of unemployment, of starvation, of hunger, of the wandering boys, of the, of the broken homes, of the, of the families separated while somebody went out to look for work. Uh, uh, these things were stalking everywhere. The unpaid rent, the eviction notices, the, the furniture and bedding on the sidewalk, the, the old lady weeping over it, the children crying, father out looking for a, for a truck to move it to his sister's flat, the sister's tenement, you know, or, or some relative's tenement where they were already overcrowded to try to move himself in, or sitting there just bewilderedly waiting for 
some charity officer to come and move him somewhere. I've seen Good stay on the pla stay on the sidewalk in that crisis. Uh, for well, I've seen them the same Goods in, the, in front of the same house with the same children weeping on top of the blankets. I've seen them stay there for three days before anybody came uh, to relieve the situation. Uh, these were the years in which we they developed, you remember, in New York City and followed by that in other cities, the pattern of the apple sellers, you know, uh, some kind-hearted man who had a surplus of apples because the farmers were in this depression too. Everybody was in it, in the depression of 29. Uh, the farmers, some, some well-intentioned farmer just thought of getting rid of his surplus apples, which he couldn't sell, there was no market for them, getting rid of them by giving them to the unemployed to sell. So they gave them out every morning at a place uh, somewhere down on mar in the market, and the unemployed uh, could get them. I don't know how they proved they were unemployed. Nobody asked them to prove it. They just got them, and uh, I'm sure they were unemployed because no man in his right mind would have taken a big tray, a big basket of apples to try to sell at five cents apiece uh, in a poverty-stricken community uh, out of which he would make just a, a little bit of pocket money. Uh, nobody would have done it unless he had been unemployed, out of work, out of wages, out of, out of money, out of everything. Uh, and they took them. And, well, you remember, some of you may remember uh, how strange the ideas of the public were about the apples. I tell you this because it's uh, a, a clue to the public mentality of the times, 1929 to 1935. Uh, uh, in this New Yorker magazine, there was a cartoon of two know, sort of pristine looking ladies with their hands crossed, walking down the street and uh, looking as if they were not unemployed themselves, but uh, and here was the big basket of apples and here was the man selling them and he had a little sign up, unemployed, and apples, five cents, and they looked at the apples and one lady said to the other, they look perfectly delicious. Oh, they do indeed, said the other. I wish I could have Oh, no. Wasn't there for the unemployed? Uh, said the other. Yeah, these were the, these ideas really were, were ideas as silly as that were broadcast in the community, uh, and, and many other strange notions uh, sort of got on top of us. I've always said, and I still think we have to admit that no matter how much fine reasoning there was about the old age insurance system and the unemployment insurance uh, prospects how much fine reasoning there was, how many people were studying it, uh, how many committees had ideas on the subject, how many college professors had written theses on the subject, uh, and there were an awful lot of them. Uh, the real proximate cause of the Social Security Act and of the old age section of the Social Security Act, the proximate cause of this was the Great Depression of 29, and nothing else uh, would have bumped the American people into this Social Security system except something so shocking and so terrifying as that was. Uh, the wandering boys were a source of terror, but it was the most natural thing in the world for great big grown-up boys, boys 14 to 17 years old, finding themselves uh, in a family where the breadwinner was unemployed, where there were other children around, where his mother was distracted by the lack of anything to buy food with, to feel himself, not, not unwanted, but to feel himself one more mouth to feed and a great big mouth at that. I ate so much, one boy said to me. I couldn't stand it. The kids were hungry. The kids, the little children, were hungry. Yeah, I couldn't stand it, so I went out to find a job, and I went out of town. This is what they did in, in, not, in uh, not a few of them, thousands of them. Thousands of them wandered around the country and were a problem to every charity relief organization to every state uh, aid or federal state uh, relief uh, station and, and, they, uh, and the railroads, the railroads were terrified of them because, you know, these boys following the rule of the road would steal a ride under the bumpers and they were frightened all the time, the railroads were, that there'd be accidents, that somebody would be killed. I think some were. It's dangerous business to ride the rods. And I remember I went out myself to see them is they finally gathered them in, the railroads. They just sort of herded many of them into the St. Louis yards. And there they let them pitch a camp. And well, there they lived in a camp in the St. Louis railroad yards, a hazard to the community, 
picking up whatever they could. I'm sure some of them learned this deal. Uh, some of them learned to be panhandlers. All kinds of things happened. These were real. These were really alarming situations. They were alarming because of the demoralization uh, and because of the of the general hazards to the community and to the, the total economy. But everything was down. Nobody could get a job. The grocer didn't employ the young boy to deliver goods anymore. He couldn't afford to. The grocer finally went bankrupt and closed up. He couldn't. He, 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 he gave too much credit. I mean, the people who were out of work at first had credit at the grocery store, and they could eat, but they couldn't pay their bill. And finally, the grocer couldn't pay his bills, and finally somebody came and sold him out. It went on like that all the time, and they could eat, but they couldn't pay their bill. And finally, the grocer couldn't pay his bills, and finally somebody came and sold him out. It went on like that all the time, and one thing led to another, and we began to realize how deep, how, how cruel, how, how very deep, how almost irremovable some of this situation had come to be. Uh, this was the situation uh, which faced people who began to be aware of the problem uh, as early as 1930. Um, a lot, of pub, a lot of private thinking went on. Uh, when I got to my office as Secretary of Labor in '33, I found on the desk over 2,000 plans. Plans, they were labeled plans. They were plans for curing the Depression. This was one of the things that happened as a result of the Depression. All kinds of people with nothing else to do, being out of work, began to plan, think. Social planning was it. Well, uh, it's extraordinary how many people in their social plans that hit upon something that sounded like social insurance. Often it was illiterate. Uh, often it wasn't uh, very thoroughly done. Uh, often it was good, well set up, typewritten, sharp pages, sharply organized, APC, one, two, three, under it, you know. A very good plan. Uh, but the extraordinary thing was that there should have been 2,000 of them filed with the Secretary of Labor in the, uh, in the previous year. And many more, thousands more, on the President's desk because everybody had apparently taken to making a social plan. This, I think, was uh, stimulated uh, by the Townsend Plan. The word plan had never been a political word before. But the Townsend Plan was wonderful. You know, I mean, it uh, sounded so good. $30 every Thursday. $30 the next Thursday if you spend it before then. $30 every Thursday, but you have to spend it right away. This was supposed not only to, to this for everybody over 65, this was to cure the, uh, the depression effects upon the aged. $30 every Thursday would do it, and if they spent it all before the next Thursday, uh, it would survive, would penetrate the market, it would revive the market for goods, that would establish and set up the the, uh, the uh, manufacturing industries, they would need money from the banks that would revive the banking industry. Everything would be fine, $30 every Thursday. Th this was a great watchword. This was a, this was a real stimulus to thinking in this country. And although it started out as the most crooked and, well, I don't mean a dishonest, I mean the most uh, uh, wavering, uh, un uh, un uh, unrealized uh, situation on the plan, it became a political uh, move of considerable importance. And when I saw that old Dr. Townsend had died just this last winter, I couldn't help but say to myself, God rest his soul, he was a good old man, he meant well, he didn't have any education, any learning, but he was sorry for himself and the other old people, and so he thought of $30 every Thursday and started this all thinking, and in particular, started the Congress of the United States because the aged have votes. Uh, the wandering boys didn't have any votes. The, the evicted women and their children had very little votes. The, the unemployed didn't stay long enough in any one place to have a vote. But the, the, the aged people live in one place and they have votes. And so every congress, congressman had heard from the towns and plan people. And then, of course, we had a lot of other plans. The technocrats were, they were busy. Um, Technocracy was so engaging, so uh, uh, so uh, interesting that people used to stop and read the literature and store windows, uh, which the technocrats hired. Great crowds would gather around a bulletin in the in the store windows, which were 
were all over the country to hear about the technocrats' plan. I've forgotten myself what it was, but it wasn't Social Security. You can rest assured of that. Uh, it was it was a it was a somewhat crazy, extreme plan, but it was based upon a good feeling and a good idea. So that planning and social thinking had begun in the American people, as they had never been really uh, vital before. Uh, we'd always sort of bumped into things. A group of reformers got an idea, and our social legislation uh, was based largely on what a group of reform people had been able to do. The whole Workmen's Compensation Act was put through in the United States, state by state, under our preconceived ideas of the of the relationship between the states and the federal government and the, and the regular, oh, the long-run uh, constitutional uh, 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 rulings of the Supreme Court on that matter. So that we took it for granted that whatever was done in the way of social legislation had to be state by state. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the American Association for Labor Legislation, however, took the lead in devising a model law uh, uh, on workers' compensation insurance and first recommended it after the Great Pittsburgh Survey of 1908. Uh, and uh, it was then talked about for a long time until in 1910 and 11 the first laws were passed in Wisconsin and the state of New York, where nearly all social legislation has originated in one of those two states, it seems. Uh, uh, so that we had, we had, this, this had, uh, out of this plan of the uh, the American Association of Labor Legislation had sprung the beginnings of workers' compensation. Now, I won't bother to go into the horrors of un uncompensated uh, industrial accidents now, because many of you know all about that anyhow, and uh, I find that many young people are simply astonished and look up at you with open mouths when you say that, oh yes, people used to get their arms pulled out in a laundry mangle, and no, they didn't get any money, no. No, did they get anything? No, nothing. Well, what did they do? I don't know what they did, you know, is all you can say. Somewhere or other, they buried themselves away in the general population. Uh, girls got their, got their heads scalped uh, in, the, in the textile machinery, which was, uh, and even the sewing machines of the dress industry in New York City get down under the, under the machine to pick up a bobbin that had fallen, and they wheels got your hair it was a terrible a terrible uh, uh, accident uh, men fell into the into the Morton uh, iron pots in the Pittsburgh district and um, of course we'll never seen again but uh, uh, this was a horrible uh, situation uh, it was accepted by the American people and, you know, well this is what he did too bad John was a good man but it was an awful dangerous trade he was in. Uh, these were generally these were accepted, and it took the propaganda of the American Association of Labor Legislation and thousands of others to start the movement uh, toward making some sort of a, of a systematic recompense uh, for injury and disability arising out of an accident in the course of employment. Uh, this all had been going on, of course, not much before 1908, uh, but just a little, a few little, uh, little signs in that direction that we were thinking uh, in terms of some, some systematic way of meeting our industrial life, which had grown so rapidly uh, and, so, and had spread so widely uh, without our realizing all that it carried in its train. So that the, the um, beginnings of, of, uh, of this old age insurance came about largely, I think, by the crisis of the times, uh, by the studies of some of the intellectuals, uh, by the effect of the old age predicament and the old age organization and the Townsend organization on the politicians. And this, of course, is the great victory. Once you get the ear of a politician, you get something real. Uh, the highbrows can talk forever, and nothing happens, you know that, and people smile benignly on them and let it go. Uh, but once the politicians get an idea, they deal, of course, in, uh, in uh, getting things done. Uh, many of them are extraordinarily able, extraordinarily able devisers of political plans that hold water. 
uh, not only as in the matter of votes, but a little more administratively. Things that ought to be done. Sometimes a little guidance helps them. Uh, sometimes they develop the pattern entirely on their own uh, on their own account. And uh, in, in uh, don't, don't ever scorn the politicians. They are really the key to these situations in which we now deal. Uh, and without the the ability to convert the politicians and to convince the politicians of the necessity and wisdom of making provision for uh, for old age, we never would have had the old age and survivors insurance system uh, or any of the other social insurances, the unemployment insurance system. But the unemployment insurance system had many more objectors, many more, uh, much more opposition within the Congress as well as within uh, the outside world. And I want to say this right now. I know you're primarily interested in the old age insurance matters and in that you have great responsibility. Uh, but the unemployment insurance was even more critical uh, remedy at that time in 1933 than was the old age who could have been handled somehow under large appropriations for relief uh, and not having their relief come as a matter of right through an insurance system. Uh, the unemployment insurance was full of, of hazards for many people, and particularly for the politicians, uh, who tended to take the old-fashioned view that there was something wrong with people who were unemployed. Uh, you know, and they ought to bear the they ought to bear the burden of their own sins. Uh, you go back into medieval writing, you go back into early 19th century writings. And you find this theme coming up all the time. There are some people who won't work, and of course, they will always be unemployed and stagger along somehow. Now, you know and I know that there are uh, an extraordinarily few number of persons who will always be unemployed and who, uh, who either don't want to or can't, uh, uh, either physical or other disabilities, do get the kind of work that they can do. Uh, but in, it's always easy to say, well, he should be, he should have learned to do something. And no, he shouldn't be cuddled. So that in the Congress, when, this, uh, when the bill was debated, always the opposition to something or other about the unemployment insurance. Well, a man shouldn't be taxed for this and for that when it isn't his fault. The employer should not have to pay a tax uh, into the unemployment insurance fund because he's not to blame for it. He can't help it. Uh, merit rating. Well, if you don't have any unemployment, why should you pay a tax uh, into the system? Uh, of course, we lost on merit rating, and I've always regretted it. Uh, I still do, and I think that sometime, and uh, the wisdom of this country and of some president who's interested in the matter, uh, we'll wipe out merit rating. You're, you don't have to administer it, so you don't know what a headache uh, it is. And this is what causes the problems about the administration of unemployment insurance today in the various states and the various state laws. Uh, but the interest in, work in uh, old age insurance began to be very great. Now, I, consider, I conceived it to be my duty, uh, even before I was Secretary of Labor, I conceived it to be my duty to uh, establish a, some kind of old age and unemployment insurance in the state of New York. How did I get that way? I don't know. I must have picked it up in the general reading that one did, in the general conversation of other socially minded people, in the general discussions that went on between intelligent and educated people about the English system and how they manage things, in the conversations that came with people who'd just been to England and spent a summer or something or other, thought it was such a nice idea uh, that uh, Lady Jones's uh, maids uh, all had a little book, <laughs> and when she paid them, uh, she wrote them a little book, and uh, that was going to take care of them when they were old. When they were 70 years old or 65 years old, they could collect something. It wasn't that a good idea. Thousands of people thought it was a fine idea when they observed it in England. Uh, they also thought that the unemployment insurance, which they knew a little about by direct contact, was a good idea. It was all fine until... Uh, we began a little propaganda about unemployment insurance and old age insurance in the state of New York. And it spread from one person to another. When Roosevelt was governor, uh, when Al Smith was governor of the state of New York, before 1920, 
uh, before 1928, in the early years of, 19, of, the, of those years, those post-war years. In 1919, we had a, a recession which was sharp and difficult, but wasn't very long-lived, uh, and so we forgot about it. But we uh, we uh, we uh, looked into. I was then say I was then the commissioner of labor in New York State, and well, we looked into this, and we fell back upon the report of the Mayor's Committee on Unemployment Insurance, uh, the Mayor's Committee on Unemployment, which was written in 19, 19 and 20 uh, by the people who had run that investigating committee as well as run the relief system in New York City. And there they had recommended some form of unemployment insurance. Uh, we started on a program of, of writing a report on unemployment insurance in 1922 in the state of New York. Uh, in, on, on the state basis, because we were in the midst of a depression, a little depression, not a big one, a little one. And at that time, I conceived the idea that it was my duty to stir this thing up. And I, got to, I got the governor to authorize me or direct me to go to England to study their system, which I did. And um, it was then full of horrors to me because I, they took me out to queue uh, to see their record-keeping arrangements. I you know all about record-keeping here. I observed this enormous building which you meant, uh, have erected, have had erected, uh, to keep your records in. It's almost as big as Q, which horrified me because it was so big. Uh, and we have the benefit of the IBM in, in genius, uh, which the British didn't have when they began their handwritten system. I remember seeing ladies walking up on great high step ladders and getting files out of shelves, dusty, dirty, many of them wearing gloves so they wouldn't get their hands dirty and hunting through the files for John Jones's record. A terrific problem of, uh, of record keeping. You don't do that today. I won't forget how startled I was when I saw the first IBM machines throw up the record in front of you. Uh, it was a, it's an amazing convenience. You don't realize what it would be otherwise unless you tried to do something of the sort. Uh, at any rate, in the state of New York, while Roosevelt was governor, and we were in the midst of this depression, uh, I did get him sort of worked up about it, uh, and uh, anyway, we decided to call, because at this point, education was the whole thing, you see, you've got to get people used to the idea. American manufacturers and businessmen were coming back from England and saying, oh, they have the dole over there, the dole is horrid. Nobody ever knew what the dole was, I do now, but uh, it wasn't so bad even then, but it was getting something that you yourself hadn't paid for. Somebody else had paid for it, and they just, when the Depression came, they put other unions onto the unemployment insurance system than those who had originally begun it and paid into the fund. Well, that's that. What were they going to do with them? They had to do something with the unemployed. They had to make some form of relief. And it was greatly resented by the older, stable, skilled trades organizations who had thought they'd done a fund for themselves to find that the government... Uh, put everybody who was unemployed on that fund. It wasn't uh, wasn't really very nice in the American businessman's idea, but it wasn't wicked. Um, although the American manufacturer took the de uh, took the idea that it was, so that we had a big group of of uh, businessmen who had books saying, "Oh no, terrible! The dole. Don't mention unemployment insurance to me. That's nothing but the dole, the dole." And I would mention old age insurance to them. They knew it easier. And they would say, no, that's the dole, too. That's the dole. I don't believe in the dole. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was greatly, uh, very much opposed to the dole. Oh, we don't want the dole, not the dole. I had a great time to get him quieted down and stop talking about the dole. And thinking, <laughs> to try to think about the realities here. Well, anyway, anyhow, this was the thing we finally did. Uh, we, um, we, had, we appointed a committee. You know, a committee that helped to relieve the unemployed in New York State first. That was his first duty. And then we conceived the idea of uh, calling a great conference, calling a conference of governors of the surrounding states. That's all the New England states and Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Ohio. For the life of me, I can't remember why we brought in Ohio. Because <laughs> it certainly doesn't surround New York. Uh, and uh, I don't know, if, but, but I do know that it was because the governor was a nice man, and uh, he was well disposed to uh, all kinds of things. I mean, uh, you know, well disposed to relief and to charity, and we assumed that he'd be well disposed to unemployment insurance, to which uh, I was already deeply committed. 
but the governor was not deeply committed to it. And this was a conference of governors to decide how we could arrange it. Because at that time, every study of unemployment insurance or old age insurance brought us up flat against this. How can this possibly be done by one state alone? The conditions are so different in different states. The tax, the tax situation is so different. The tax laws are so different. Uh, the, the, the industries are so different. The, the uh, composition of the population is so different. There are great, great, uh, great uh, collections of, of, old, of aged people in some states and very few aged in others. California at that time was not the prize old age state as it is today. Uh, but uh, there were equally uh, odd uh, differences between the states. So how could any one state, how could Arizona, how could Alabama, how could the state of Maine, with its enormous population of old people, its, its uh, decline of youth because they all leave Maine and go to the country, go to the city, uh, how could they possibly uh, have an old age insurance system? Uh, or an unemployment insurance system? How could they rely upon their own uh, ability to collect enough taxes or enough money from the unemployed or the aged when they were working uh, to carry such a system? It was a very difficult thing to do on the small exposure, the small, I mean insurance-wise, actuarial exposure uh, of a particular state. So uh, we couldn't figure it out for New York State even, which is a large, rich state with uh, high tax values and all that sort of thing. It just wasn't, uh, there wasn't enough exposure. There wasn't enough, uh, uh, an, enough uh, collection uh, to warrant it. Uh, so uh, we, did, we, we discussed this in this governor's meeting. We hit upon the idea, which I think Roosevelt had already had planted in his mind, of a regional pattern. That is, perhaps, uh, we just, the, the, the New York Port Authority had just gone through where there was a treaty between New York State and New Jersey to develop the port of New York. And that was an idea. Uh, that might be done. These adjoining states, these contiguous states, which had similar industries, similar population problems, might join together to form systems. So this was a regional uh, idea, uh, the idea of a regional plan. And we worked on it to, to some extent. The interesting thing is, however, that we talked about unemployment insurance, and we talked about old age insurance as insurance, and we talked about it for four mortal days. And finally we came out with a report, which Paul Douglas, whom we had sent for to come and guide the conference, Paul Douglas of, of uh, Chicago, uh, then a professor of uh, social uh, subjects at the University of Chicago, and now and more recently a member of Congress and a and a senator of the USA, uh, was the guiding hand. I mean, he was the secretary of this conference. And he guided not only the hand, but the thinking uh, of the conference, uh, which was very useful. At any rate, they came out with a proposal uh, to think of some form of unemployment insurance on a regional basis. Well, that was as much as you could do in the, in the winter of 32. And in the spring of 32, Franklin Roosevelt went out to Chicago, went out to Utah, to the Conference of Governors, the whole which meets regularly, you know. And uh, in the conference, of, he was already, of course, Sub Rosa, a candidate for the presidency of the United States, although he hadn't been nominated. Uh, so that his action, I may say, <laughs> was both brave and daring, and at the same time, it was uh, subtly uh, attractive to the voter. Uh, he made a speech in which uh, it's full of, you know, pleasant hyperbole of one sort and another, flattery from various governors. And but at one point, rather, well, he began to discuss the great problems now facing this country, and he spoke about unemployment. And uh, then he said, "I am for unemployment insurance, but not the dough." Until we heard those words come over the. Uh, wires. I wasn't sure he was going to say he was for unemployment insurance. I was afraid he was going to say he was against the dole and nothing else. Uh, although it had been written, uh, he had it before him, uh, and it was the action of this committee, of gov a small committee of governors of contiguous states. Uh, I wasn't sure it would come through, but it did. Uh, and that, of course, was the first time he had ever committed himself as far as that. 
and it created a great uh, interest and a great enthusiasm uh, among the voters, which I think he was not uh, slow to catch on to. Uh, he had that kind of a mind, you know, and um, it was one, of, one of his great geniuses was that he could uh, feel a public pulse and he cared about the public pulse. Uh, the, uh, this, of course, was, the, was great news to most of us, and we even uh, bent our energies to getting something into the Democratic National Platform. Well, we didn't get much, <laughs> but we got something. We got the dirty word mentioned. Uh, unemployment was mentioned as, the great, as the, a great and outstanding problem of the United States in the year 1932, and the Democratic Party in its platform uh, put a clause in which they said it was a problem, and they promised to study the causes of unemployment as though anybody had, uh, hadn't studied them for years. People had never found the real cause. Uh, they promised to have a committee to study the uh, causes of unemployment and presumably to remove them. And then they promised at least to study uh, and look into uh, the whole matter of unemployment insurance. It was a very weak clause, which our friends... Uh, who were quick to pick up and tell us that we had betrayed them and all that kind of thing, but they didn't appear before the committee that was drafting the platform and know how bad the platform might have been on this uh, subject because most of the members seemed to me to be uh, determined that there should be nothing said about unemployment, that uh, it would frighten people away from the Democratic Party. But you remember it didn't frighten them at all. Actually, nothing frightened them. They would have voted for anybody who was running and for any platform who was running because they wanted to change. They didn't like unemployment. And nobody liked it. Everybody was depressed. Every industry was depressed. Every individual had some sort of stake in the situation. Um, so we got the first public mention and the first public commitment to do something or other about unemployment, at least to study it. And this, of course, was a great feather in our cap. In the, in the, in the, of those, the, the, when I say our cap, I mean in the caps of those who had already committed themselves in this direction and who really uh, had determined to help each other uh, to find some way out of the situation and to get some form of social insurance here. At any rate, this was the situation when Roosevelt was elected and we went to Washington. Uh, before I was appointed, I made a little a little conversation with Roosevelt in which I said uh, I didn't, perhaps he wouldn't want me to be uh, Secretary of Labor because if I were I should want to do this and this and this. Among the things I wanted to do uh, was to find a way uh, of getting unemployment insurance old age insurance and health insurance and I remember he looked somewhat startled and he said uh, well can you think it can be done and I said I don't know uh, he said well uh, constitutional problems, aren't there? Yes, very severe constitutional problems, I said. But what have we been elected for, except to solve the constitutional problems? Sir? Lots of other problems have been solved by the people of the United States, and there's no reason why this one shouldn't be solved. Uh, well, he said, you think you can do it? I don't know, I said. But I said I wanted to try. Uh, and I want to know if I, have, if I would have your authorization. I won't ask you to promise anything. He looked at me and nodded wisely. All right, he said, I will authorize you to try, and if you succeed, that's fine. <laughs> uh, well, I said, that's all I wanted. I didn't want any, I don't want you to put any blocks in my way, uh, but uh, we'll see what we can do. There are plenty of people who want it, I said, who want it badly and will work for it. This is the way it all began. Uh, then, of course, we got into the office, and, you know, the relief problem was overwhelming, and and uh, the NRA was making an awful noise. You couldn't hear anything else but the NRA shouting. And uh, it was a little difficult to keep the idea alive, but I took it upon myself to mention uh, unemployment insurance at least every second meeting of the cabinet. <laughs> Just to mention it. So that it wouldn't die, you know. It wouldn't get out of people's minds. And, uh, well, the final the time came when I tell you John Garner said, I think we ought to be doing something for the poorer kind of people. Uh, uh, this was, uh, you were just keeping it alive, but by this time it was quite late, you see. It was June 1935 before we got to the point where um, 
NRA was quiet enough, and uh, and relief was quiet enough, and Harry Hopkins was noisy enough, uh, so that uh, we could uh, think about this thing seriously. So uh, I mentioned it again, and then I proposed to the president, since he was trying to close Congress down early and have everybody go away, uh, that we uh, uh, that we establish our study right now, and that we get a bill ready to present. Uh, the next year, the next uh, session, which would be the 1st of January, 1935. Uh, well, this was, uh, this was all right, and nobody objected, uh, because it was a study problem. We discussed it in cabinet one day, and I remember it was funny to see these cabinet officers, uh, the view that they took. I remember plainly all of them, whatever they said. Uh, Henry Wallace was the most educated of any of them on social matters, and he said, yes, he was in favor of it, but this was no time to do it because it was inflationary to take tax money out of the general public and give it into the government hands. Tax money should be circulating to stimulate the economy. Uh, Henry Morgenthau, Secretary of the Treasury, agreed to that. Uh, War and Navy didn't have any ideas at all. They were, at least they didn't express them. Uh, Harold Ickes merely said, okay in a rather Ickesian tone. Uh, and um, uh, George Dean, of, George Dern of Utah, who was a Utah, had been the governor of Utah, and was a splendid person, heart in the right place, and intelligent, and, and uh, industrious, good person, uh, said, I think it's got to be done, Mr. President, the quicker the better. And so it went around the table. Dan Roper of South Carolina said, I think it's a very good idea. Sounds very good. Uh, anyhow, they all more or less agreed that the president should appoint a committee. And then to, uh, so then we decided how to appoint the committee. Uh, you know, I had, I suddenly got frightened as I saw what a committee might be. You know, a regular congressional public uh, administration investigating committee. It takes us 10 years to make a report. And, uh, <laughs> I, so, so I tried to stop any proposals of that sort. They'd begin, begun already to say, Senator So ought to be on it, and Senator So and So, and so forth. And uh, a few governors should be on it. You know what happens when you've got a great big committee with representative people on it. Terrible job to get anything out of it. And we suddenly thought of um, a small committee, you know, just a little committee, uh, to explore the subject, which the president should appoint, and they should all be members of the cabinet in order to keep this thing close up so that the president could be sure they didn't get off on the wrong foot and didn't go to proposing some crazy idea, as you know, over-liberal. Over and also, so they didn't get to proposing very, very, country, very, very uh, conservative ideas which wouldn't give the unemployed and the aged much of anything. Uh, we needed this president's hand on this. So all of us who were responsible only to the president and not to anybody else, uh, would have been appointed. It was a small committee, as he said. And he appointed, as you remember, cabinet, members of the cabinet. And he called it the Committee on Economic <coughs> Security. He didn't like the word insurance. That meant the dole. So he wanted that dropped out. So we dropped it out. Semantics is nothing to me, and uh, I guess not to anybody else either, is it? But uh, at any rate, we dropped the word insurance, and we had Committee on Economic Security. Of course, everybody since then has pointed out that it wasn't economic security at all. And uh, even before we got the wrong making the report, uh, we regretted the idea that we never had the names of economic uh, security because it was really social. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the name was, it was the, the president liked it. He didn't know much about economics, but he was determined to have a good system of economics. So this was the Committee on Economic Security. Everybody was talking about how the economy was busted and we needed a good economic program. So this was this Committee on Economic uh, Security. And uh, it was appointed and it was uh, uh, Congress uh, hastily uh, received the President's report and, and authorized the committee, but uh, adjourned with, uh, uh, without making any appropriation, you remember. Uh, to support the committee. Well, here again was a problem, and I was talking to the president, and he said, well, look, Harry Hopkins has got all that money. They just made enormous, uh, you know, appropriations for Harry Hopkins' relief problem, 
you go get some of Henry's uh, money. Well, I said, I don't think that's legal, is it, you know? It belongs to Harry. It belongs to Harry. Uh, uh, oh, well, you can get that. And then he said, then get a... Then this was a bright idea, really. It's what people used to do, you know. I don't know why they don't do it now more in the government. Uh, borrow people. Just borrow what you need for staff. Why, there are all, num- all kinds of people working in Washington. <coughs> borrow them. Army's got them, Navy's got them, Agriculture's got them, Labor's got them, everybody's got thousands of people working for them. You don't really need them, he said, you know. <laughs> well, you know, it was his view, and I'm not sure it isn't mine, really. It's not uh, I, I think somehow with the... Uh, well, I, I won't talk about this because this is uh, critical of uh, other people. But the proliferation of jobs in the government uh, since I left it <laughs> 25 years ago uh, is uh, astonishing, you know. And I see an awful lot of people, and I wonder what they do. Except for that, of course. But anyhow, I, I, this was, uh, anyhow, we said borrow them. So we borrowed them. But, we, but mostly it was, it was agriculture and labor who contributed to the uh, to the staff and uh, I think and the Attorney General gave us half a dozen lawyers who we didn't know what to do with otherwise and uh, uh, but they were good people so it happened I had to pick of them and uh, we took a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars from Harry Hopkins but on a promise it was sort of a promissory note uh, that we would employ only the unemployed with that hundred twenty five thousand dollars but that was Oh, well, that was all right, you see, because there were plenty of research people, plenty of statisticians, plenty of college professors, plenty of people who know how to dig uh, for facts and so forth and so on, who were unemployed. And it was not a, and a stenographers, of course, and clerks, by the dozens were unemployed. So that it was not, that was a very good, good scheme. We took only persons o- otherwise unemployed. And for that, we used Henry Henry. Henry Harry Hopkins is $125,000. And the thing got off to a start. Well, we, you know, we had a great many devices, as you probably know. Uh, since you administer this act, you probably know of the tricks, of the, of the problems we went through getting it organized. We, we called in, uh, we began to see right away it was some job to do it. Uh, we knew we had to have actuaries. <laughs> well, the, the Lions Club of America and some other big service organization put up the money for actuaries. Think of that. It was a really wonderful thing that they did because nobody else had any ideas about actuaries. But they had a small insurance system in their own scheme of things and they knew actuaries. So they gave us their actuaries and the Equitable Life Insurance Society gave us two actuaries. That was, of course, a little political pull inside the Equitable Insurance Company, I must admit. Uh, but we got two first-class actuaries from them. Uh, the, uh, we, we got a lot of people just by just as a gift who were able and willing. Uh, we, of course, we had to have a driver. We had to have somebody to sit and drive these people. That was what we got Ed Whitty for from the you know, University of Wisconsin. Uh, we borrowed him first for three months and then for the duration of the problem. Uh, and he was a tower of strength in it himself because he knew how to direct, how to get work out of people who uh, were scattered in their organization. We didn't have much time, because we set ourselves January 1st, 1935, as the date of our report and plan. Uh, we borrowed, uh, we borrowed uh, uh, university people who, beginning in July, were on leave, uh, you know, summer vacation. Uh, we borrowed quantities of them. Now, if you know anything about I didn't know as much about university people then as I do now, um, uh, but uh, university people, teachers, professors, are a problem in themselves. Uh, and, uh, they have great pride of opinion, and great, uh, great, and they're very vocative. They can give voice to their opinions wonderfully, and they can write reports just in a minute. Uh, you know, it takes no time at all to write a report. It's a different thing to do the report, but to, you know, to do what the report recommends. But they can write them in no time. And we soon found that we had a team of very high-strung people on our hands, and somebody had to direct them. And William was just perfect. He was the university man himself. He was the custom. He was 
accustomed to dealing with irate and excited scholars uh, who didn't want to be disputed about things they knew to be or thought they knew to be facts. And um, uh, he was just, and he was a very practical man. He'd been in the legislative bill drafting department at the state of Wisconsin. And he knew how to set up a law. He knew what you had to have in it. He knew what the situation required. And he could calm them down with his superior knowledge better than the rest of us could. At any rate, we worked all summer. We had a technical advisory committee, which were these high-strung people. Uh, we, had a, we had a general advisory committee, which had employers and laborers and, uh, and employers and labor and the general public on it. And this wasn't so hard to handle uh, because the, uh, I may say, the general public had been well picked, uh, you know, the way you pick a committee. And uh, they were all perfectly good people, you know. Even the employers had been well picked. There was Marion Folsom of, uh, of um, the Eastman Kodak Company. Uh, I, I, some of us happened to know him and uh, knew him to be a good man with a kind of a social mind. And, uh, well, you know what became of him. He worked for that committee, and next thing he turned up was head of the uh, uh, head of the whole Social Security Administration. And a very good person he was then and is now. Uh, a man of great ability who really dedicated himself to the promotion of these ideas. Uh, this was the great scheme of work. It was a terrible hot summer, and everybody worked hard all the time. And uh, finally, you know, they actually did bring forth a report uh, in the 1st of January, 1935. Uh, and it was a report that recommended uh, unemployment insurance, old age insurance, and admitted health insurance just because they couldn't get through with health insurance in time to make a report on it. And it was true, they couldn't. I mean, they had uh, you know, intellectual difficulties that arrived. Well, now, of course, the great problem, in, in, you can see, was the well, actuarial problem was a very great problem. Uh, how you, when they had, the actuaries had to know, before we had hardly met, they had to know how, what, what we wanted them to figure it out. It hadn't occurred to me until then that the actuaries have to have something to go on. They're accustomed to measuring the hazard and the exposure and the, uh, and, the, uh, and, the and, and the victims who are involved in the insurance contract. But they have to know first what is the exposure. How many people are going to be in this pattern? Uh, who's in the pattern? Who says what, you know? And how many people do you expect to be? How many people will be victims? How many people will we have to give compensation to? We can't make the actuarial tables without that. We have to know how many. The population of the United States is 160 or something, 50 million. Uh, how many of those will be involved in this? Uh, this is one of the funny things, of course, is that we so desperately underestimated the number of people that would be covered by the Social Security system. They had to have one set of figures for, for the old age system, another set of figures for the unemployment. And we greatly underestimated the, uh, the uh, number of persons in both categories uh, because there were no statistics on the subject. We didn't know. We couldn't know these matters. Uh, but they fi we finally rigged up, uh, you know, a preconceived state. We assumed, we assumed uh, that any law would have to give uh, uh, a four-week waiting period. And we assumed a certain number of persons covered and we assumed, we assumed a minimum payment of $15 a week uh, as minimum, but not to exceed one, I think it was one quarter of the weekly wages of the unemployed person. And something about like that for the aged persons also, one quarter of the wages of the weekly wages of the previous earnings, the latest earnings of the aged. This is what that we gave them to figure on. They did a very good job, I may say. The legal... Uh, committee at once broke into a row, of course, uh, because the legal problems were so terrible, the constitutional problem was the great one. How could you get around this business of the state-federal relationships? Uh, it was, we were having a great wrangle about it when one day I went out to tea, not because I wanted to, but in Washington you don't go to parties just because you want to go. Uh, you know, you go because you have to go. And I had to call upon Mrs. Stone, the wife of the Attorney General, and she was at home on Wednesday afternoons. And I so, about 
5.45, which is nearly the end of the day, I, I went to her house and presented myself, you know, there were a lot of other people there, went to, out to the dining room to get a cup of tea, and uh, there I met Mr. Justice Stone, who had just come home from the court and was getting his cup of tea. And uh, we greeted each other and sat down to have a little chat, and he said, how are you getting on? And I said, all right, and then I said, well, you know, we're having big trouble, Mr. Justice, uh, because we don't know in this draft of the, Social, of the Economic Security Act that we're working on, we're not quite sure, you know, um, what will what uh, what will be a wise method of uh, of establishing this law, and uh, it's, it's a very difficult constitutional problem, you know, and uh, we're guided by this, that, and the other case, and we and he looked around, Mr. Ben was listening, and he put his hand up like, and he said, the taxing power, my dear, the taxing. You can do anything. <laughs> I didn't question him any further, uh, because it wasn't proper. I knew it wasn't proper for him to tell me, and I shouldn't say it. Uh, and, uh, but I went back to my committee, and I never told him. Oh, I got my great information. As far as they knew, I went out into the wilderness and had a vision. But, uh, <laughs> and so I did. Uh, but... Uh, Anyway, I came back and said I was firmly for the taxing power. We weren't going to rig up any of these curious constitutional relationships. The taxing power of the United States, you can do anything under it, said I. And so it proved, did it not? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, of course, some of you don't remember the uh, anxiety with which some of us watched the first case go before the uh, uh, Supreme Court, but it came down absolutely all right, the opinion written in elaborate fine social language by Mr. Justice Brandeis. Uh, not by Mr. Justice Stone, but uh, he voted aye on the matter and we were safe. Uh, and this is the reason, of course, that we have, we build so strongly on the taxing power and that the whole system of taxation is the basis of the Social Security Act. Uh, we tax, uh, we tax the aged uh, when they're young and we tax all the other young people for the Social Security system. Uh, while they are at work, and then when they retire, uh, they are eligible. Well, of course, you know, this whole thing in the actual airport led us into, into the problem of what to do with the half-aged, what to do with those who are already uh, 55 and had never contributed, and, you know, we rigged that up on a compromise basis. It was all sorts of trading within the committee. But the report finally went in, and it was a good enough report. It wasn't... Uh, it was not perfect by any means. There had been trading within the committee. Uh, there had been secret work uh, by certain members of the committee who didn't want to show their hand. Uh, and there had been a great fight in the President's Economic Security Committee. Uh, this was really a tough fight as to whether we should have a federal state system or a pure federal system. And I cannot tell you how many times uh, I changed my mind and I cannot tell you how many times the other members changed their mind. We voted once to have it uh, a pure federal system. Uh, by the time they'd been out of my office uh, a couple of hours, they began to get telephone calls from them individually, saying they thought we ought to meet again, uh, that there was something to be said against that, and they would like to review their vote, and could we meet next week? So we would, and we, we'd vote the other way the next week. We'd vote to have it a federal state system. And uh, then uh, we had the same experience. People would telephone, want to revise, want to review it again, and we'd meet again. This went on for weeks. We came really up to the date when the report had to go in uh, within a, well, within a week. And I then took the strong measures of asking them to come to my house, not for dinner, but after dinner. <laughs> and then I uh, told them I was going to lock the door. And... Uh, we would, st we would stay till we had settled it and there would be no review. This was the final and the last thing. We'd have to settle it tonight. Well, we locked the door and we uh, had a lot of talk and uh, I laid out a couple of uh, bottles of something or other to cheer their flagging spirits. And um, anyhow, we, we, well, we, we stayed in session until I think it was 2 a.m. when they broke up and we had then voted Finally, and we had taken our solemn oath that this was the end. We would never review it again. That this was the end of it. We, we, we voted then to make it the state federal system. Now, there were reasons for that. The reasons were entirely practical. We knew, of course, that a federal system, just as you've long known, 
in the unemployment insurance would have been a much simpler thing. But there was the opposition in the Congress to unemployment insurance was very large. Uh, the opposition to to old age insurance was very small. Uh, the opposition in the Congress to old age to unemployment insurance took the form of being in favor of uh, merit rating, uh, which is a, a pestiferous thing. It makes the, it gives the it gives the insurer uh, uh, the, the, the opportunity not to pay his tax if he doesn't have much of the hazard, and that throws your whole system into disorder. If that if the bill had come up on the floor of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the Senate or of the House uh, as a state federal system as a federal system, uh, they would surely have put in amendments here, amendments there, amendments to the unemployment insurance galore until they would have gotten a good name. But the bill would not have passed. This I was sure of. I'd seen it happen in New York State. I'd seen it happen in other places. And the president agreed with me that it was the thing they would certainly do. They would pass old age insurance, and they would not pass. Uh, the unemployment insurance part. So we put it all in one bill, and then we acted as though we were rigid. It uh, wouldn't compromise, not compromise people by insisting that it all go through as one deal, unemployment insurance and old age insurance. And so we find this is, this is the reason that, uh, that it was done, because of the belief uh, that the Congress would have monkeyed with the unemployment insurance sections so much that we would have not have, we would have lost the bill entirely. It could not have been passed. But with the states coming in to run the unemployment insurance, you always had to say, well, the states can experiment in this line. The states can experiment with that. It won't ruin the whole system. And so we have got that right now firmly fixed upon us, but I think not so firmly that it can't be modified at some future time. This, of course, was the genesis of this whole bill. You know that we've done a great deal of propaganda, a great deal of speaking, a great deal of educational meetings, a great deal of education by one kind of uh, propaganda or another, chiefly hearings. Senator Wagner put in a, a bill which he called a model bill and held public hearings at the Senate. Uh, this attracted a great deal of attention of the senators. Uh, we had a number of senatorial committees uh, which we asked to look into this or look into that. And we got advice. All these were done for the purposes not so much of advice as of <laughs> propaganda, of education of the public. And we, I don't remember how many speeches we made. I made uh, over a hundred speeches myself in that period. And practically everybody else who had anything else to, anything to do with the scheme had, had many, many speeches. And the result was that finally a bill was presented to Congress. And as you know, the history of it, it was debated very briefly, really quite briefly, when you think of what the problems involved were. Only a decent amount of, of debate. Uh, and uh, we gave way on all kinds of things. We gave way on uh, on the walk, washing out universal insurers, uh, you know, universal coverage. We let them uh, uh, take out one group, off for another group, no objection, just so we got the basis of the bill. And finally we got the basic bill, the basic underlying bill. It came through after amendments and so forth and was passed in August 35. Uh, with the extraordinary uh, vote of only nine votes against it in the Senate. One could hardly have believed that that was possible. I forget the House vote, but it was almost the same. Uh, you know, perhaps 90, 90 votes or something of that sort. You all saw on the record, you know it. Uh, a very small vote against the bills. And here it was established. Well, of course, you know, the two committee chairmen, uh, Pat Harrison, of Mississippi, the last of the orators, they used to call him. He was a wonderful orator. I'm so glad I lived to hear him make an oration. It was a wonderful political experience just to hear him. Uh, he didn't know the first thing about this bill, uh, but it was his bill, nevertheless. He introduced it. And Bob Doughton of North Carolina, he knew even less about it um, because he was deep and he couldn't hear what was said to him already. Uh, but there wasn't so much debate in the House. Senator Harrison had to present it. Well, this was the occasion, of course, in which uh, Mr. Thomas Elliott, now the president of St. Louis Law School, um, undertook to sit on the steps of the Senate beside Pat Harrison and pass him up the answers to the questions that were asked him 
Uh, I understand Mr. Elliot says he never was a page and didn't wear short pants. I never said he wore short pants. <laughs> I just said he did sit on the steps of the Senate and give the answers to Pat Harrison. Uh, but Mr. Elliot is sensitive for fear somebody would think that he ever uh, masqueraded as a Senate page. Uh, however, these things were funny and they were all a part of what the boys and the rest of us did in the effort to put this thing through. Tom Elliott was then a boy. I mean, he was a youngster in the, in the legal department and uh, he was doing the thing that would help most that he could do. It finally went through and it was in a blaze of glory. Harrison was congratulated and, and, uh, and uh, Dalton was congratulated and they all beamed and, and uh, I gave a party. <laughs> to my astonishment, uh, Mr. Dalton accepted the invitation and came. Uh, he said, and his wife said, you know, we've been in Washington 35 years, and we never went out before where we stayed later than 8 o'clock at night. Uh, but this is a great occasion, and Bob wants to come. So they came, and they stayed until half past 8. And, uh, <laughs> the Harrisons stayed a little longer. Uh, but uh, it was a perfectly simple party, but it was one of great rejoicing, uh, which we all felt was justified. Uh, and then, of course, began the great problem which you have taken over, the administration of this act, because thousands and thousands of problems arose in the administration, which had not been foreseen by those who did the planning uh, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the legal drafting, uh, and, of course, the bill had to be amended and has been amended and amended and amended and amended until it's now grown into a large and important project uh, for which I think the people of the United States are deeply thankful. One thing I know is it is so firmly embedded in the American psychology today that no politician, no political party, no political group could possibly destroy this act and still maintain our democratic system. It is safe. It is safe forever and for the benefit of the people of the United States. Thank you so much.